Thank you for standing by and welcome to the Paradigm Biopharmaceuticals Investor Webinar today. Firstly, apologies for the short notice on this webinar. We've been in a holding pattern waiting for the ASX to lodge the announcements. Uh, regardless, the webinar is being recorded and will be available via Paradigm's announcement uh, website and social media channels shortly after the conclusion of this live session. All participants on, on the call are in a listen-only mode. There will be a slide presentation today lasting for approximately 40 minutes. Due to the late start, we'll take questions offline. So if you do have any questions, please send them through to investorrelations at paradigmbiopharma.com. Uh, that email address is at the bottom of all announcements and the team will respond to you in due course. Online on behalf of Paradigm today, we have Chairman and MD Paul Rennie, Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Donna Skerritt, Global Head of Osteoarthritis, Dr. Mukesh Ahuja, and Director of Investor Relations, Simon White. I will hand it over to Paul to begin. Please go ahead. Thanks very much, Matt, for the introduction and um, uh, good morning to all of the attendees uh, attending from Australia and also Asia. And uh, good afternoon, good evening to uh, people dialing in from the United States. As Matt said, apologies for the late start, but we were ready to go, uh, but had some um, process uh, and publication issues with the ASX. So uh, I'm really delighted today to be able to um, demonstrate that uh, Paradigm has generated the data from its Para008 clinical trial. And this is the data at the six month time point. And today's presentation is going to be the top line results. So we're going to tell you what has happened uh, with the, the PPS group versus placebo. And of course, what we intend to do is we will drill down further into the, the data and then our clinical team and medical writing team will start to prepare a manuscript so that the study can be peer reviewed and published at some future date. Next slide, please. Um, as investors will know, uh, as an ASX listed company, we're required to uh, highlight our disclaimer. Next slide, please. So I'm going to um, present a, an overview of the data, and then I'm going to pass on to my colleague, Dr. Donna Skerritt, who's going to take you through in some more detail, uh, particularly into the biomarker and the clinical aspects. And then Donna will hand over to Dr. Mukesh Ahuja, who, will, who is our Global Head of Osteoarthritis Program, who will take us through the um, imaging results. So this is the structural changes that have occurred in the PPS groups at the six month time point. So uh, in terms of an overview, uh, I'll just uh, going from this particular slide, the key highlights of, again, this is day 168 results now, as you know, previously we published the uh, day 56 results. So this is the six month follow-up. We've seen multiple signals at day 168 of disease modifying activity with injectable PPS or IPPS. Again, reminding everyone, this is a subcutaneous injection, it's not intra-articular. Uh, MRI at day 168 demonstrated changes in several functional disease features consistent with D-mode eff efficacy. And most notably, we saw improvements in cartilage loss, bone marrow lesions, and osteophytes. Now, this is according to the experts in the field. These are the four key biomarkers to look at for disease modification. So these four key biomarkers are ARGS, C2C, COMP, and CTX2. And all of these biomarkers represent fragments of the cartilage that, as it breaks down, are able to be measured in the synovial fluid and serum, and in some cases in the urine. So th these are, according to the experts, such as um, Dr. Virginia Krauss, the key biomarkers to look for for disease modification. And we've demonstrated favorable changes in the IPPS treated subjects compared to placebo. From a clinical point of view, we've also seen durable and consistent positive clinical responses in WOMAC pain, function, stiffness, and overall WOMAC score at day 168, which is really a remarkable outcome. We also noted that rescue medication was used 
over four times more frequently in the placebo group compared to the twice weekly IPPS group. New MRI, molecular biomarker and clinical outcomes will be presented to the regulatory authorities, the FDA and EMA, to seek their advice on what further data that Paradigm needs to generate to support a disease modifying label. Next slide, please. Now, some uh, investors may ask, why, why is Paradigm exploring IPPS for D-mode potential in parallel to pain and function? Well, firstly, we look at this uh, question from the perspective of the patient. We know that the patient at this stage of their osteoarthritis, uh, which is the moderate to severe osteoarthritis, is now generally experiencing high levels of background pain and uh, significant joint stiffness, which is uh, disabling for their day-to-day -day activities, such as walking, uh, going up and down stairs, et cetera. So from a, a patient perspective or from our customer perspective, um, we believe that there is a very significant unmet need for a drug that is safe and effective and can also slow down the progression of the disease. So slowing down the destruction of the joint tissues. So um, we, we believe that most people want to be able to understand that their disease is getting better uh, over time by taking the medication. So we understand there's a high met, a high unmet medical need for new safe and effective therapies for osteoarthritis. Now, from an in investor point of view, we need to remind everyone that currently there is no approved D-mode therapies for osteoarthritis. So there's no product that is registered with the D-mode label. And 81% of osteoarthritis patients are dissatisfied with their OA therapies, and that comes from a peer review publication. And we also know from our own independent global market research, which was conducted in 2021, which stated that a D-mode label for IPPS would significantly increase the price per treatment course because it would stave off um, the uh, cost of joint replacements in the future, et cetera. Uh, it would also keep the patients from uh, visiting doctors with ongoing issues around their pain management, et cetera. So it will increase the, the reimbursement price. And also given the fact that there's hope that this drug will stave off the destruction of those joint tissues, physicians and patients were more likely to use IPPS as first-line therapy. So as soon as they're diagnosed with osteoarthritis, um, doctors would probably think the sooner I start with this drug, the better the long-term outcome for this patient. And we do know that uh, if we look at um, the economics, if we get a disease-modifying uh, label, we could see the price increase um, from around about $2,500 per course of treatment to $6,000 per course of treatment. Now, when you do the numbers and you work out uh, and move that uh, $6,000 to frontline therapy, it generates some uh, what some people think are incredibly large numbers in terms of the, the, the revenue generated from this product, such as you know, $10, $20 billion in sales per annum. And some people think that's incredibly uh, large and could, could not necessarily be attainable. However, what we advise people is to take a look at the history of Humira. So just to remind you, Humira since 20, sorry, 2002, so 20 years, generated uh, top line revenues of $208 billion for that 20 year period. And that's because uh, Humira moved the rheumatoid arthritis patients from uh, drugs that were treating the symptoms to a disease modifying drug. And they achieved a much higher price than those drugs treating the symptoms, which was methotrexate and corticosteroids. And so we saw a huge shift in the size of the rheumatoid arthritis market based on disease modification. So a precedent has been set and we think that a disease modifying label in osteoarthritis, which is a much larger market than rheumatoid arthritis, would similarly attract a very large sales somewhere in the region of 10 to $20 billion per annum. Now that's obviously the best case scenario. And I'll just remind investors that 
e even for whatever reason, if we don't get a disease modifying label, we still have a blockbuster opportunity on our hands. Even seeing pain and function improvements out to six months will be a highly sought after therapy by many patients who have osteoarthritis. So we still think that that will generate billions in revenue, even at two and a half thousand dollars, given the uh, op or the lack of alternatives on the market for safe and effective and durable uh, drugs on the market for treating osteoarthritis. So we think it's a it's a, a goal that is worth pursuing, and the data that you're going to see today gives signals that this particular drug, injectable PPS, has certainly got the signals and, and the signs of being the first disease-modifying drug for osteoarthritis. So with that, I'll pass over to my colleague, Dr. Donna Skerritt, to take you through in, in some more detail. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Paul. So first, I'd like to start out by briefly describing the programs that Paradigm has uh, conducted to investigate PPS as a potential disease modifying agent. We've previously completed a study, PARA 005, in Australia that enrolled 126 participants randomized to PPS or placebo. The subjects receiving PPS received two milligrams per kg twice weekly for six weeks. The disease modifying endpoints uh, to note here are that at day 53, uh, molecular biomarkers such as uh, COMP and Adams TS5 were reduced in the serum compared to the levels in placebo. And likewise, urinary levels of CTX2, another biomarker of cart cartilage degradation, was reduced compared to placebo. And as you can see on the slide, these reductions in COMP and CTX were statistically significant. We also monitored patients by MRI and then uh, following patients who had bone marrow lesions, the grade by MRI demonstrated clinically meaningful reduction in the PPS group compared to placebo. Again, statistically significant. So here we're seeing from this study, uh, biomarkers in the serum, urine, as well as structural evidence of disease modifying potential uh, with IPPDS. Now to the next study, which we'll be discussing further today, PARA-008. This study enrolled 61 participants to uh, be randomized to injectable PPS or placebo. There were two treatment doses, two milligrams per kilogram twice weekly or two milligrams per kilogram ideal body weight once weekly compared to placebo control and the treatment course was six weeks. We've previously reported to you the day 56 biomarker results from synovial fluid assessments. And at that time, at day 56, we noticed and reported out reduction in inflammatory cytokines, TNF and IL-6, reduction in pain mediator, mediator NGF, reduction in byproducts of cartilage degradation, COMP and ARGs, and an increase in an inhibitor of cartilage degrading enzymes, TIMP1. And all of these ob observations are favorable compared to the placebo group, thus indicating to us that at day 56, we have an anti-inflammatory effect, a uh, direct effect on pain through NGF and uh, reduction in products of cartilage degradation. So some potential cartilage pres preservation uh, effect. Next slide, please. These findings in uh, uh, the, this study and the prior study are very consistent with our understanding of the mechanism of action of PPS. We know that through NF kappa B, we have impacts on inflammation, pain, tissue preservation, and uh, circulatory changes. Next slide. So further information on our para uh, top line results at day 168. Just as an overview, we are conducting this program to understand what happens to serum and uh, urine biomarkers, as well as understanding structural changes uh, from the time of PPS exposure through uh, six months. This biomarker study 
0008 assess changes from baseline and multiple objective measures associated with disease progression of OA. And the data we'll present to you today will go out to six months. Most of the patients uh, uh, will be followed out to the full 12 months duration of this study. We previously reported the outstanding top line results at day 56, improvement in multiple biomarkers in synovial fluid as well as fluid, also improvement in uh, clinical uh, outcomes measured by WOMAC. These were statistically significant improvements in pain, function, stiffness, and the overall WOMAC score for the twice weekly arm compared to placebo arm. At day 56, significant changes in clinical outcomes were not seen in the once weekly arm compared to placebo. Next slide. So what are the structural imaging biomarkers being evaluated for PPS uh, as potential disease modifying uh, treatments for OOA, for osteoarthritis? Well, there's several that have been outlined that are the targets for uh, structural assessments. Those include subchondral bone marrow lesions or bone marrow edema lesions, joint synovitis, cartilage thickness, uh, bone shape, including the presence of osteophytes, and joint space width. And as you can see in the middle column, the uh, assessment tools for evaluating these are primarily MRI, although traditionally X-ray was the mode of assessing for joint space width. This can be uh, uh, calculated by MRI uh, very um, um, precisely at this point. And the pathology related to these e regions is shown in the right column, uh, subchondral bone marrow lesions uh, being uh, indicators of more severe pain as well as more rapid degradation of cartilage and um, uh, progression to total knee replacement. Synovitis being associated with inflammation and pain cartilage thickness as a measure of uh, degeneration of the cartilage, and osteophytes and joint space with assessing adverse bone remodeling. So these are the structural markers that uh, we consider as uh, uh, meaningful when trying to understand disease-modifying effects of PPS. And I will now hand over to Dr. Mukesh Ahuja to tell you about the findings in parallel weight evaluating these structural endpoints. Thank you, Donna. <clears throat> Dear all, um, I'll present the top line results from MRI-based semi-quantitative scoring system named WORMS. WORMS, which is an abbreviation for whole organ magnetic resonance score, is a comprehensive scoring system which is extensively used in osteoarthritis studies worldwide. The MRI images were read by an independent organization with trained musculoskeletal radiologists for accurate and reliable reading. The MRI images were obtained at two different time points. First, at the screening visit to establish pretreatment of short arthritis disease characteristics. Then the follow-up MRI was performed at day 168, which is six months from the initiation of treatment, to identify differences in disease pro progression between the IPPS and placebo groups. Here, it is important to note that despite the relatively small number of subjects in each arm of this study, and the short follow-up interval compared to the generally slow structural progression in osteoarthritis, changes consistent with D-mode efficacy were observed in a number of disease features. These structural changes were most no noticeable in cartilage, bone marrow lesions, and osteophytes. Now, with the next slide, I will share key findings for these three disease features. Cartilage loss, which is known to be most important disease feature of osteoarthritis and is also considered to be predictive and clinically relevant endpoint of knee replacement surgery. In the PARA OA008 study, once weekly IPPS cohort showed an average 21% improvement in mean cartilage loss score in the medial femur, whereas the placebo arm showed a 4% worsening of core cartilage loss. The twice weekly IPPS group showed a stabilization of cartilage compared to the placebo. The next disease feature with a statistically informative change is bone marrow lesions. Bone marrow lesions are related to microtrauma resulting from overloading caused by loss of the normal bearing function of articular cartilage. 
numerous studies have suggested bone marrow lesions are also predictive of knee replacement. In this study, bone marrow lesions in the lateral femur decreased by an average 38% in the once weekly IPPS arm, whereas in the placebo arm, it increased by 47%. In the entire lateral tibiofemoral compartment, BMLs decreased by an average 17% in the once weekly IPPS arm, whereas increased by 56% in the placebo arm. Twice weekly IPPS group showed improvement compared to the placebo. Next slide, please. Marginal osteophytes, also known as bone spurs, these are osseous outgrowths and is a common feature of osteoarthritis. They are believed to form as an adaptive response to mechanical stimulation or inflammatory cytokines, according to more recent research. The osteophytes increase in number and size as the OA disease progresses. As shown in the figure, with increase in Calgary-Lorentz osteoarthritis grading, increase in severity of osteophytes is seen. In the para oa 8 study, osteophytes decreased or remained stable in all three compartments of the knee in patients treated with IPPS compared to an increase in the placebo arm. With that, I will yield back to Dr. Don Isker to go over clinical and molecular biomarker results from the OO8 study in excess steps. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mikesh. So as we've just heard, some structural changes uh, associated with PPS have given us three areas for consideration of disease modifying uh, endpoints when looking at MRIs at day 168. I'll now share with you the clinical as well as the biomarker data at uh, the day 168 uh, endpoint. The twice-weekly IPPS group demonstrated durable responses in Womax scores for pain, function, stiffness, and overall Womax scores compared to placebo. Twice-weekly IPPS compared to placebo showed durable pain reduction. Womax function at 50% improvement occurred in 53% of twice-weekly IPPS subjects compared to 22% in the placebo arm. PGIC, the patient global impression of change was favorable at day 168 for the PPS arm. And at day 112, IPPS showed Womack stiffness was significantly improved over placebo of function at a strong trend of improvement over placebo as well as overall Womack index uh, favoring IPPS compared to placebo, a very favorable trend. Placebo group used rescue medication four times as often as a twice weekly IPPS group. And that translates to 23 days versus just five days within the PPS arm of subjects uh, requiring rescue medication. Now, um, for people who are familiar with the treatment of OA, uh, they may have an understanding of uh, medications being used multiple times a day uh, for weeks, if not months on end uh, for osteoarthritis. And so what we are seeing here is really quite meaningful telling us that with this single course of IPPS, the number of days of rescue medication was uh, much uh, lower in the PPS treatment arm. Next slide, please. So what molecular biomarkers uh, are uh, important to evaluate for a PPS uh, effect as a potential disease modifying treatment for OA? This area has been researched by experts in the field for several, uh, several years and markers have been identified in these categories. We've previously talked with you about our effects on pro-inflammatory cytokines and our effects on pain mediators. Today, we're going to focus more on the joint degradation biomarkers. And there's a list of biomarkers here that have been evaluated and known to play uh, some role as markers of cartilage degradation. So these are the types of biomarkers that were considered uh, in our study. Next slide, please. So at day 168, we noted changes in synovial fluid, serum, 
and urinary biomarkers favoring the PPS group. IPPS disease modifying potential in knee OA treatment was demonstrated by alterations in four of the biomarkers. Synovial fluid, fluid and serum samples of ARGs and COMP, COMP show favorable changes in the IPPS group compared to placebo. Data analyzed from serum C2C and urinary CTX2 also demonstrated persistent beneficial effects of IPPS compared to placebo. These four biomarkers of focus have, an extensively, have been extensively researched in the literature uh, as establishing their role in uh, identifying cartilage breakdown in OA subjects. So these are biomarkers that have been identified as uh, indicators of cartilage breakdown. And so as we'll show you on the next slide, uh, where we're able to reduce the detection and presence of these biomarkers. This is indicating that cartilage degeneration uh, or degradation is reduced in that treatment arm compared to placebo. So as I mentioned, there are four general biomarkers of interest, um, C2C in the serum, CTX in the urine, COMP in both synovial fluid and serum, and ARGs in both synovial fluid and serum. And in each of these cases, these markers of cartilage degradation are reduced in the PPS group compared to the placebo arm, uh, particularly for the cases of the serum measurement of C2C and the synovial fluid measurement of ARGs the reduction with PPS was statistically significant compared to the placebo arm. So we now have clinical results, biomarker results, and structural changes all consistent with PPS improvement in clinical changes as well as uh, disease modifying potential. Next slide. So what are our next steps uh, for the disease modification program? Over the coming months, we expect to study, uh, to evaluate the new MRI molecular biomarker and clinical outcomes uh, to prepare them for presentations with regulatory authorities. Paradigm intends to initiate discussions with the FDA during the second half of 2023. We have previously announced that we have fast track designation for this program, and that uh, facilitates easier access to the FDA and an opportunity for more frequent dialogue on this development program. Paradigm's aim is to agree with the FDA and EMA on the required regulatory pathway for a D mode indication. You've heard earlier in the presentation today about some of the advantages of having a D mode indication on the label, both clinical and commercial advantages. The feedback from uh, the EMA will also be useful as we assess our next steps with the TGA provisional approval um, program. And finally, our data set from day 56 and day 168 time points in para-OA-008 uh, clinical study will be prepared for peer review and publication. And I'll now hand over to uh, Mr. Paul Rennie for a summary of our upcoming news flow. Paul, you just muted. Sorry, if you just want to. Come back. I'm sorry. Uh, thanks, Matt. Yes, um, I wanted to say uh, thank you very much, Donna, and thank you, Makesh, for um, outlining those data. It's incredibly exciting to see the, the role of IPPS versus placebo in patients with osteoarthritis, seeing changes at structural level, biomarker level, and also consistent and persistent effect of uh, managing their symptoms. So in terms of the near-term news flow, um, as uh, I think most investors understand, osteoarthritis is our lead program, but we do have a orphan indication program, which is uh, mucopolysaccharidosis or MPS, where PPS is being used to treat the residual pain in MPS subjects. We are doing an MPS 6 phase 2 clinical study uh, in Brazil, 
um, that's gone extremely well and we hope to be announcing 100% recruitment of that study uh, in um, the next quarter of, of this calendar year. Uh, the canine OA model, uh, which is the 26-week follow-up in canines equivalent to a three-year human equivalent follow-up, that data will also be out at the end of Q2 this calendar year 2023. And that will give us some insights in terms of the durability of the disease modifying effects in a canine model of um, natural osteoarthritis in the dog. So we're looking forward to those data to supplement what we've already seen in humans. Um, later this uh, quarter, we'll also be announcing uh, the PARA002 clinical trial update. Uh, as we've previously, previously announced, we do hope that we will finish stage one of that adaptive design, which is the, the dose finding uh, part of the 002 study. Uh, we hope to have um, 470 uh, subjects recruited by the end of June, and we'll be providing an update in early June how we're tracking with that milestone. Uh, we'll also, in the second half of this year, be announcing the PARA008 clinical trial 12-month follow-up. So that will again be reporting on the uh, structural changes by MRI, the biomarkers in the serum, synovial fluid and urine, and also the clinical outcomes, looking at the effect of pain and uh, effect of the drug on pain and function out to 12 months. Uh, we also will have um, a, a release which will outline the MPS1, which is a phase two study B that has finished enrolment and has uh, waiting for follow-up to complete. Uh, that was a study conducted in Australia. And the MPS6 uh, program, which is the study in Brazil, both these uh, two phase two clinical trials will re be reporting top line data in Q4 this year. And I know that the MPS Society is very, very excited about the MPS study because it is a double blind placebo control study. And um, we are expecting to see some very big things from, from that particular trial. And as uh, I've mentioned previously, Paradigm continues to be in active discussions with multiple potential partners for its phase two asset in mucopolysaccharidosis. And we also are expecting to see an uptick in interest with the osteoarthritis program, given these outstanding data. So uh, that brings to the end uh, our presentation for today. So I'd like to again, thank everyone for attending. As Matt said at the outset, if you do have any questions, please email those to Matt and uh, we'll circulate the email address for questions. And we'd be more than happy to provide you with some um, answers uh, going forward. And again, uh, please note these are top line data. The um, bulk of the data will be summarized and put into a peer review publication, which we uh, ex expect to submit that manuscript um, sometime in, in the calendar year 2023 or calendar year 2024, depending upon uh, availability of journals for review of such manuscripts. So again, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Mikesh, for presenting. Uh, thank you, Simon. And also thank you, Matt, for hosting us. Thanks, Paul. And thanks again to the team. That concludes today's Paradigm Biopharmaceuticals webinar. Once again, the replay will be available via the website and social media channels later today and also at the same link announced to the ASX. Uh, so thanks again to everyone who's joined and goodbye for now.